to each other, which is good. Uh, now there are some tiles on this floor, not very different from what you would see in like the buildings of Tri-C for sure. So um, square tiled floors are one of the easier things to do, um, you know, compared to things on diagonals and kind of crazier um, patterns. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But the first thing you have to do, and I'm going to zoom in a bit. So when I zoom, you'll be able to see all this better, but also you'll be able to see some of these details within the, um, the doors just a little better than before. Uh, but what I did was if you want your drawing to be accurate to what you're looking at real life, you could get go as far as to count how many tiles there are. And so what I did was um, left to right across the space of the hall, I counted and there are kind of um, seven rows of tiles that or columns that go this way. Uh, and so I checked on my ruler and I tried measuring that out in inches because what you have to do is kind of divide this space of the back wall by seven and see if it, it um, divides out clearly. It didn't through inches and I just got really lucky. I flipped it over to the centimeter side and it just so happened that my back wall was exactly seven centimeters. Um, now, all of us are drawing in different sizes, so they may not work for you. Um, you might have to do a little bit of math. You can also kind of wing it a little bit, but you want each of these to be the same size, no matter what. That's the most important thing, because that'll make your grid the same. So whether you do one centimeter each on these, which is what I did, you could go half an inch. Um, you know, uh, half an inch is a little bigger than that, maybe a quarter of an inch, kind of your call. Um, so you may end up with less or more tiles than what's in the original image, and that's okay. But if you notice, these are my centimeter marks. So I went across this bottom line, starting in this corner, and I went one, two, three, four, five, six, and that's my seven. Um, now, once you have those, we're gonna play, you know, that connect the dots game again between our vanishing point through each of those centimeter points and then all the way down to the bottom of the page. So let me show you what that looks like. Um, gonna do one here. Make sure, really important, you get this line accurate and going through the point you want it to. Okay, so that's our first one. Now, don't do what I did necessarily and draw quite as dark as I did right here. Make sure that you're going kind of light. I have a dark pencil, um, probably shouldn't, because this in the end is gonna be erased. That's just our work. The important part is starting at the floor where the, the wall and floor meet. So right there where our measuring point is is really where we wanna draw these. So from now on, I'm only gonna draw up to this point and down um, just to save myself some erasing. Now this doesn't look like much yet, but I'll show you what happens when we fill this in. So I'm gonna go ahead and connect all of these dots. Remember to go all the way down to the bottom of your paper. All right, so good enough for now. That's our um, tiled uh, columns to the floor. So right now they kind of look like, ooh, let me zoom out a little bit. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so that's taken us all the way to the edge of the paper. Um, super important. Um, so um, those right now look like more columns, so maybe wood planks across the floor. But now we wanna make it appear as if um, we're looking at tiles, right? Like a checkerboard pattern. Now this is where we're gonna have to use a little bit of guesstimation. Um, there are ways to figure out exactly how we want these tiles to be spaced perfectly in, in space. Um, we could definitely do that, but it's time consuming. And you know, since this class is uh, not only perspective, it's not like an interior design class or something like that, um, we're just gonna go with our best approximation. So I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, so I'm gonna draw a horizontal line. And I'm just using my reference image to see where that first horizontal line comes. It comes a little bit above the molding of this door. Now these all look relatively like, you know, they could be squares that are skewed in space. That's a good sign. Now, as we work our way up, one, this has to be a horizontal line the whole way across. True horizontal, that's important. But as we go, they have to get smaller and smaller and more skewed in space. So um, the size of this in the beginning is kind of huge. By the time we get back here, they're gonna be really, really small in the distance. So let me show you what I mean. Now, it would be weird to make it this small right away, so we have to do it gradually. So this next one, I'm gonna go maybe around here. Again, trying to make sure my ruler is completely level and I accidentally didn't draw this all the way across, so I'm gonna go ahead and draw that one. Beautiful. 
Okay, and then we're just gonna approximate, slowly getting slimmer as we work our way back into the distance. All right, now if you notice guys, we need to keep this going all the way as we go back. I'm starting to get really, really small, the gaps between my tiles, which is not a problem. It's probably how they look in the original image because when you get a lot of deep space, things really get skewed and small in distance. But that means that you know you have to have a really sharp point on your pencil, um, You know, keep those lines straight, and we're gonna keep getting smaller and smaller. Just be sure that you don't, um, don't aggressively go too small too early because then there's no way it's gonna look realistic anymore. You kind of have nowhere else to go if you start really, really small uh, to start out with. There we go. And now hopefully that looks like a pretty believable space where you have big tiles in the foreground and then they're getting smaller as you uh, zoom on back into the distance. Um, let's look at a few more um, elements. So one would be this like um, rail, handrail that goes along the wall. Um, I'm just going to guesstimate where I see that at the lower right corner. Let's see. And I'm also going to think about where it comes across back here by the door. So you can kind of see how high it is on our door, somewhere around here on the wall. That handrail kind of comes right down here. I'm going to check and see if that seems like it could be accurate. Not bad. I'll show you what I did there in just a second. I'm going to make this really light, light to start out with. So what I did was I looked at that handrail keeps going on forever all the way down the wall to this back corner. If we look roughly about how high that handrail is on this wall, you can adjust and, and um, guesstimate where this point is, cross from your vanishing point to that point, and just keep on going. And that's going to be the top of our handrail. And it looks good compared to how I see it in my um, original source photograph. So if that's the case, I'm going to also have to find a bottom point to this rail. And the bottom point seems to come maybe about here. It's kind of thick here in the foreground. I'm just going to go a little slimmer with it. We don't want this thing to be too big of a monster. And if that even feels a little too big, I might go just a little slimmer. I think I like that as the bottom of that rail, so that's what I'm gonna go with. Now notice I drew that line all the way across, but very lightly, because some of it I'll probably have to erase. <clears throat> so with that rail, here's what's happening. That top of the rail is gonna come right out here. It hits the trim of the door, and it's gonna shoot out horizontally it goes out beyond the door a bit, and then it curves back around. That's the top piece of the rail that looks three-dimensional. So again, top of the rail comes to the trim of the door, rolls out to the left, kind of horizontal, and then it's going to cut back this way. Now the direction or the angle it cuts back this way will correspond back to our vanishing point. So let's check this out. We now have the upper dimensional part of that rail kind of sticks out from the wall that far now you can take that line and take it back forever all the way back to the vanishing point and that's going to give us the thickness of the rail as we go back now that means that if we drop a vertical line down right here that rail actually comes out forward and overlaps the door just a little bit and you make that as vertical as we can so in reality i can erase that bit of door trim now bring this on back here. I'm just going over the line that I had already drawn. Nice, and now you've got a dimensional, realistic looking um, trim that comes out or handle. Now I'm gonna do that same thing and I'm gonna work my way across here. Because I already have like the trajectory for where this handle is gonna go. The tricky thing is just make sure you're putting it only between the doors and not, you know, 
sitting on top of the door. Okay, one last thing I'm gonna mention. It's the same reason why this was a little bit funky right here. In this part of the door, I was trying to figure out what's going on. What I'm gonna do is where the trim, the very top line meets the, the top line of this handle, or rail meets the trim of the door. I'm gonna make it look like a little point and then it's gonna have a curve to it. So the reason is that um, handle, if you look in the image, is kind of rounded. So right there, it's more like a crescent moon shape a little bit. And down here, it's gonna do a similar sort of a thing. A little bit of a soft roundedness. Sorry guys, I'm being messy with my lines. Okay, soft roundedness. And then it's just gonna slowly curve into place along that track that we made. All right guys, so we've got door handles, we've got the doors here. I shouldn't call these door handles, it's like a handrail is what I mean. Um, we've got the back wall tiles, so it's starting to shape up here. A few more details we'll talk about that are a little bit maybe tricky and then um, it'll just be a matter of putting all the detail in. Okay guys, getting back into it. Um, going to uh, show you some of these details, but we're gonna, uh, I'll kind of be quiet here. I won't talk too much and I'm just gonna um, let the video kind of play through at a high speed and you can watch my logic as I work through some of this. <clears throat> I won't put every single detail in this video, um, but I do want to show you what the latter stages of a drawing like this would be. So we've gotten a few detail areas put in, right? Still plenty more to do. But once you have uh, the majority of your objects in here, and obviously I'm jumping the gun, I would want to fill everything first. But um, the next step would be applying line quality to and line variety to this drawing. Um, so I'm going to speed up the video and show you how I do that. The most important thing, and we'll talk about this at the end, is that I'm gonna think about the darker and bolder lines being way up here in the foreground and the lighter and thinner lines um, zooming away, way in the distance. Okay guys, um, <clears throat> continuing on with this uh, perspective drawing, the main thing I wanna show you, and nowhere near done, these things take a lot of time, but notice how the, the line elements in the foreground are so much thicker and darker, and as they zoom away, way in the distance, they kinda of go fainter. That's a really good, um, uh, that's a good way to approach this um, idea of line quality and line variety when you're dealing with depth, darker and bolder, marks are always gonna come forward because they're contrasting to the white of the page. And the lighter your marks are, the less they're gonna contrast. And you want less of that contrast way back there in the deep space versus something like this, which is really gonna pop out in your foreground. <clears throat> 